A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am glad to be back behind the microphone again uh, after a, a week away. I did not get everything accomplished during my uh, working vacation that I was hoping to, but I got about half of my to-do list done, so eh, better than nothing. I guess the other rest can wait for nights and weekends. Anyway, I'm glad to be back uh, with you today. Got a lot to talk about. Uh, in fact, we, we, this is the bad thing about being away for a week. You've got so much to talk about, you hardly even know where to begin. So... Um, very quickly, Supreme Court, no action today on New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Corlett. They did turn away a couple of cases dealing with nonviolent felons who are hoping to regain their Second Amendment rights. We're going to talk about that tomorrow uh, in great detail with Alan Gottlieb from the Second Amendment Foundation. Uh, but today I thought we would focus on what is going on in states around the country. Uh, obviously, you know, Joe Biden, he is pressing for gun control on Capitol Hill. He has uh, introduced his executive actions, this first initial uh, executive actions, and I suspect that there is more coming. Uh, but for the moment, gun control appears to be bottled up on Capitol Hill. I say for the moment because you know that uh, gun control activists and uh, fellow Democrats are putting a great deal of pressure on West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, uh, maybe Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema as well, to remove their objections to the filibuster, to allow for gun control to pass with just 51 votes, and then to lobby them to support the uh, gun control bills that have already passed the House and those that are uh, coming down the pike as well. Um, I'd like to hope that uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are going to stand firm in their opposition to nuking the filibuster, but, you know, things change. Uh, and, uh, obviously again, Democrats are applying a lot of pressure, particularly in the wake of high profile shootings, uh, including the one in Indianapolis just a few days ago, gun control activists, though, they are not waiting on Congress. Um, you know, look, they've got a multi-pronged approach here, right? If they can get stuff done federally, then they'll do that. If they can't get stuff done in Congress, they'll use executive actions. If they can't, uh, if they don't have a president, uh, who is opposed to uh, your right to keep and bear arms in the White House, they'll try to use the courts. Uh, and they'll also use state and local governments to try to advance their anti-gun agenda. That is what is taking place today around the country, a number of states uh, where Democrats are partnering up with gun control organizations to try to move the ball forward, their gun ban ball forward, uh, at the state level. Ohio lawmakers, eight Democrats, are uh, hosting a, quote, gun safety conference today. No, it's not a gun safety conference. It's a gun control conference because their goal is not gun safety. Unless you buy into their idea of what gun safety is, because their definition of gun safety is don't own a gun. Right? That Plain and simple. That is their idea of gun safety. You and I would call that gun control, because it's not even a matter of just, you know, voluntarily not exercising your Second Amendment rights. It's a it's about putting barriers between you and your right to keep and bear arms. We're seeing this in Virginia as well, where Attorney General Mark Herring holding a, quote, discussion on gun violence prevention today, uh, along with the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, hosting a virtual roundtable discussion uh, on Monday, law enforcement professionals, advocates, and affected families will participate, set to discuss ways to better protect Virginians from, quote, gun violence and to keep communities safe. Yeah. You know, Democrats in Virginia have been in complete control of the state legislature for two years now. They have passed a number of gun control measures in the state of Virginia. And in 2020 which was the first year that Democrats had complete control of the legislature, violent crime in Virginia actually increased at the fastest rate in decades. Mm -hmm. Now, Virginia had one of the lowest violent crime rates in the country up until about 2020. And now things have started moving in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not saying that is because of the gun control laws in place. 
What I am saying is that a ban our way to safety mentality doesn't do anything to actually stop violent crime. In fact, it takes us down the wrong road. It expends political capital on things that don't work as opposed to doing the things that actually can make a difference. Case in point, Oakland, California. After the deadliest day of 2021, Oakland reels from gun violence. That's the uh, story from the uh, uh, San Jose Mercury News. Oakland, California. Plenty of gun control laws on the books at the state level in California, right? In order for you to legally buy a gun in California, you have to go through a background check. Universal background checks. Those are the law in California. 10-day waiting period for every purchase of a firearm. Uh, You have to go through a background check every time you purchase ammunition in the state of California. It is illegal for a California resident to drive to Nevada or drive to Arizona, purchase ammunition, and then bring it back inside the state. That is a crime in order to, if you do that. You also have uh, California's micro-stamping law, which is uh, 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 blocked uh, all new models of handguns from being sold in the state of California for about a decade now, right? Uh, you've got a May issue concealed carry system that in Oakland and uh, most other major cities amounts to a no issue carry process where very, very few concealed carry permits are handed out uh, because they don't recognize the right of self defense as a valid reason for you to obtain a firearm. Then you've got your quote unquote assault weapons ban. You've got your magazine ban. Again, all kinds of gun control laws on the books in Oakland and California. And yet, in this gun control paradise, violent crime is increasing. In fact, April 10th, according to the Mercury News, the deadliest day of 2021, three homicides in Oakland, California. Oakland has now 44 homicides so far this year. A uh, Mercury News says if the pace continues, Oakland will have a triple-digit homicide count for a second year in a row after years of declines. So what's going on here? Well, according to the Mercury News, they say uh, police and activists, they don't say what kind of activists, just activists, which I find kind of interesting because you could be a Second Amendment activist, you could be a gun control activist, you probably would diagnose the uh, problem very differently. The San Jose Mercury News just says police and activists blame two outgrowths of the pandemic a surge in firearms on the streets, and a curtailment in violence prevention programs reliant on personal contact for boosting the deadly totals. Sequence Young, the Berkeley Youth Alternatives Garden Coordinator, says we know it's dangerous on the streets. Being a uh, young black man in America is dangerous, period. Usually when things like this happen, it's a kid hanging with the wrong people or got caught up. You don't even have to be in these streets these days. You could just be passing through and get caught in the crossfire. Uh, That uh, individual, uh, Sequence Young, worked with a uh, young man, 18-year-old Demetrius Fleming Davis, who was shot and killed on April the 10th. He had just helped prepare raised garden beds at the internship where he was working on tops of shifts at the uh, Dollar Tree between junior college classes. He was riding in the back of a friend's truck when a bullet from nowhere came and killed him, according to the Mercury News. Homicide detectives say Demetrius was simply in the wrong place. So, so let's talk about what's going on specifically in Oakland and, and, and maybe bring it out, expand it to what's going on around the country. Uh, is the idea that more guns automatically equals more crime? According to the San Jose Mercury News, the answer is yes, right? According to police, according to activists, that, that's, that's one of the big problems here. They get, you just got more guns. Well, I would disagree with the idea that more guns automatically equals more crime because that's not been the experience of the United States for the past two and a half decades. When violent crime continually dropped and the number of privately owned firearms continued to increase. So the number of concealed carry holders in the United States, top 20 million, violent crime continued to drop. As the number of states adopted constitutional carry, violent crime continued to drop. So, It's a simplistic solution to say that, uh, well, you know, if we just got rid of the guns, first of all, not all that easy to do, easy to say, not all that easy to do. But secondly, 
the presence of more firearms in privately owned hands does not automatically equal an increase in violent crime. We've seen this. We know this. This has been the American experience for over two decades. So I would argue that perhaps maybe we have more guns in the hands of people who should not have them, in which case a conversation needs to be held about why California's gun control laws are not preventing these individuals from illegally acquiring and illicitly using firearms in the commission of violent crime. Because it sure seems like these laws are having a negative impact on would-be legal gun owners in California. Again, turning them into a criminal if they were to drive over to uh, Reno to pick up some 9mm and then bring it back home. What's, what, what else is going on here? What's the, what's the other explanation? They say uh, a curtailment and violence prevention program is reliant on personal contact. That's a, that's a really uh, wordy way of saying programs that focus on the most likely to offend, uh, who are also, by the way, the most likely to be the victims of violent crime. Those programs largely stopped in Oakland, California last year uh, because of the pandemic, because of the, uh, you know, health orders that came down from on high from folks like uh, Governor Gavin Newsom that prevented activists from actually engaging in the outreach uh, to these communities that, that, that stop these uh, violence prevention programs. They've actually been pretty effective in Oakland in reducing violent crime from continuing last year. That's what actually changed. Look, we saw record high gun sales in 2020, but we've had strong gun sales. We've had millions of firearms sold every year in this country. That's not new. We had more of them last year. But again, we've had two and a half decades of more guns and less crime. What's new, starting last year, is the pandemic and the impact that the pandemic has had on the criminal justice system, as well as on these violence prevention programs, these grassroots local programs that were largely curtailed. You also have seen not only the, the uh, emptying of jails and prisons around the country, um, but you've also seen the criminal justice system grind to a near halt in many cases. And you've had you know courts that have been closed for months on end. So you've had a, an even greater reliance on plea bargains. You've had cases that have just been sort of left in limbo. And individuals return to the streets while their cases are not working their way through the court, but are just sort of stalled out because of the pandemic. I would argue that the largest driver of violent crime since March of 2020 has not been the increase in gun sales in this country, but has been the decline in consequences for those who commit acts of violence. When you have people who are literally getting away with murder, and that is the case in many major U.S. cities where the homicide clearance rate is below 50%, that creates a cycle of violence. If offenders believe that they can get away with their crimes, they are more likely to commit them. And that, that is something new. Well, I won't say it's something new, but it has gotten exponentially worse uh, over the past year, we, we've had a criminal justice system that is reliant on plea bargains, but we haven't had a situation where courts are largely closed. And at the same time, police are being told, hey, uh, don't enforce these uh, low level offenses. Don't make these arrests. In some cases, police have voluntarily pulled back because of riots, because of unrest, because of the uh, the fear that if they do something wrong, they're going to lose their job. They could face criminal charges themselves. Uh, and so you've had this sort of, whoa, 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 okay, we're just going to take a sort of a hands-off approach here to dealing with violent crime. That, I believe, is what has um, largely driven the increase in violence in Oakland, California, uh, as well as around the country. And the idea that, well, we can reverse all this by simply curtailing the, the right to keep and bear arms of American citizens. 
is absolute nonsense. Again, look at California, all kinds of restrictions on the books. And yet, last year, Oakland, California, along with Los Angeles, along with San Francisco, along with virtually every major city in the state, saw their violent crime rates increase dramatically. And this uh, increase has continued into 2021. If any state in the union, let's put it this way, if gun control worked to reduce violent crime, then of all of the states in the union, California would be the least likely to have seen a surge in shootings. And yet, and yet, in California, that surge started a year ago, and it has continued unabated ever since. And again, unfortunately, gun control advocates in places like Ohio and Virginia are going to be lobbying lawmakers today to put more California-style gun control laws on the books with the false hope and the empty promises of increased public safety as a result. All right, let's turn our attention now to our uh, good deed of the day, our recidivist report, which is a lot about what we've just been talking about, uh, as well as our good deed of the day. We'll start with our recidivist report. This is from uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, from the uh, Kenosha News. On probation for a previous shooting, men arrested after an AR-15 style rifle found in a car. This was uh, Sunday. Two Kenosha men charged with possession of a firearm by a felon. After a a rifle found in a car, uh, when police received a call about people drinking beer and smoking pot at a uh, local park, a a caller reported several people in the parking lot drinking. The area smelled of marijuana. Uh, Police arrived to find several people near the back of a pickup truck that was parked next to a Honda Pilot. According to the criminal complaint, police believe the smell of pot was coming from the uh, Honda. They asked the driver and passengers for their identification. The uh, passenger in the rear seat identified himself as Isaac Garcia. The uh, passenger in the front seat said his name was Alex Zolot, actually uh, Xavier Zolot, and uh, police later learned that uh, he was on probation for a 2017 shooting, which Garcia, who is also on supervised probation, was his co-defendant. As a condition of their probation and supervision, both men were ordered not to have contact with each other. Whoops. And uh, that wasn't the only whoopsie. According to the complaint, police searched Garcia's vehicle found the uh, AR-15 style rifle under a sweatshirt in the back seat. Uh, There was a 22 caliber rifle magazine, a box of 22 caliber ammunition matching those in the two magazines, uh, 40 rounds in the box of ammo, the uh, two magazines each loaded with 20 rounds. Uh, The 22-year-old Garcia and the 21-year-old Zolot, both charged with being felons in possession of a firearm. And again, these two gentlemen, young men, still, apparently didn't ever face any real serious time for being involved in a shooting four years ago. They're back out on the streets. And without any consequences, what's likely to happen? They're likely to continue doing what they've done. They've they've encountered the criminal justice system. They've been arrested. They've been charged. They've gone to court. And they were told by a judge, don't do this again, or then we're going to have to get serious with you. What do we think is going to happen when these two criminal defendants go before a judge in a case involving a shooting? And rather than spending significant time behind bars, they're going to slap on the wrist, put back out on the streets. Do you think that makes them more or less likely to reoffend? Does it make them more or less likely to have confidence that the criminal justice system will deliver swift and certain consequences if they break the law, if they break the terms of their probation? I would argue, given the current state of our criminal justice system, it makes it far less likely that individuals like Garcia and Zolot will actually abide by the law after they've been convicted of uh, their violent felonies. All right, on to our armed citizen story of the day from Pearland, Texas, where a uh, hammer-wielding man broke into a home and was shot by a uh, gun-owning homeowner. This from uh, Channel 2 in Houston. They say the uh, home invasion happened uh, Saturday night 
about 1030 in the evening. Police say uh, once the intruder broke in, again, armed with a hammer, the uh, homeowner managed to grab his gun and shoot the intruder multiple times. Three people in the hospital, their condition uh, unknown as of last report. Uh, Two of those individuals uh, believed to be residents of the home. And the uh, third suspect or the third individual who was uh, injured was the uh, would-be intruder who was shot by the homeowner. Uh, Finally today, our good deed of the day, Asheville, North Carolina, where an employee of the city, Anthony Buzz Brown, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to save the life of a stranger. This was last month. He's driving down Sand Hill Road. He uh, works as a leak detection specialist. And he passed a guy standing on a bridge, an overpass over Interstate 40. Guy standing there just kind of looking down at the traffic. He noticed that the uh, man seemed to be distressed. And so Brown turned his truck around, drove back, got out, walked up to him, told him his name, asked him for his name. Brown said, he told me there was nothing I could do to help him or save him. And he said, um, he said, the thing that upset me the most was how many people drove by him knowing the condition that he was in. Again, Anthony Brown saw him, saw this guy was clearly in distress. I said, I, I, you know, I, I can't just drive by. He was the only one who did, that, who did that. And it may be because Anthony Buzz Brown's brother, Cornelius, took his own life at age 22. So Brown struck up a conversation with the guy. He said, I'm not here to judge you. I'm, I'm here to care about you. And I've got a story to tell you if, if you will listen. And he started telling the man about his brother, Cornelius. And I'm sure he told him about the pain that uh, his entire family, all of his friends, continue to feel knowing that Cornelius took his own life. And as Anthony Brown's talking to the man, the man starts talking back. He starts telling him about everything that's going on in his life and why he's there on that overpass. Eventually, they both walked off the overpass. They walked back to uh, Anthony Brown's truck. Asheville police arrived shortly after, transported the man to get medical assistance. Anthony Brown Worked for the city for uh, 15 years. He was recently recognized by the Asheville city manager. And uh, Asheville police officer Vincent Garetto, who responded to the scene, said, I'm confident without Anthony stopping and talking with the man, he may have possibly jumped before officers arrived on scene. Anthony very well saved a life today and should be recognized for his actions. Anthony Brown says losing his brother was, quote, one of the most devastating things that happened to our family. He said, I just hope that I can help anyone who has lost a loved one to suicide or anyone who's thinking about suicide. There is hope out there. and They're not alone. We have to do this for one another. So Anthony Brown, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. We thank you for your very good deed. We thank you for your uh, words of wisdom. And again, you know, you see stories like this. And this could have turned out very, very differently uh, if it were not for the actions of somebody who is willing to get involved. I remember uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, we were talking with Ryan Petty about this new Secret Service report on preventing targeted school attacks. And the fact that 94% of those individuals who intended on inflicting violence at a school had actually talked about their plans. Obviously, this is a very different situation. Somebody who's intent on committing acts of violence from uh, from somebody who is just, you know, so despondent that they're thinking about taking their own life. But I would argue that one of the commonalities is that whether it's somebody who's planning an act of violence against a school or against their former place of employment or against a family member or somebody who is even just thinking about taking their own life. Oftentimes, there are signs. They can be hints. Uh, Boy, that guy looks like he's in distress. 
or they can be blatant warnings. They can be, you know, uh, individuals explaining exactly what they plan to do. And that Secret Service report that came out a few weeks ago talking about how to prevent these types of targeted attacks said the number one thing that can be done is to communicate. When you see something, when you hear something that bothers you, that sends those warning bells going off in your head, don't just drive by. Don't just let it go and think that, well, you know, somebody else, maybe I'm just imagining things. Somebody else will, uh, will take care of it. If your gut is telling you, all right, there's, there's cause for alarm here, then you need to be the one to act. Whether it is having a conversation, opening up about your own history and your your own loss, or talking to the uh, authorities and saying, hey, listen, I, 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 I heard somebody say they're planning on doing something. I think something needs to be done. Now, that uh, begs the obvious question, what happens when the authorities don't follow through? as has been the case in several of these incidents. And uh, that is an important consideration. It's a problem that needs to be addressed as well. But unless we know what's going on, then we can't take any action. The failure to act is another problem entirely. But the failure to um present this information to try to prevent these types of attacks that that is something i think that each and every one of us uh can actually start to change through our own actions all right we're going to be back tomorrow with uh, more of the latest second amendment news and information from all around the nation alan gottlieb from the second amendment foundation is going to be with us don't forget in the meantime you can subscribe to town hall media on youtube that way you'll never miss a program also, uh, Bearing Arms Cam and Company on Rumble and Bearing Arms Cam and Company on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Channel.com's podcast page. And of course, don't forget to uh, check out BearingArms.com throughout the day for even more of the latest Second Amendment news and information. Thanks again for being a part of the program. Sorry for my absence. I'll see you very, very soon. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.